brain, so we'll take the questions and I will tell you if I can't answer them. Um, I know that I can be quite uh, quiet for spoken on occasion, so I'm going to put the mic on. Um, if I do get quiet, shout, and I will uh, do my best. But you should be able to hear me better with that. Um, I hope I can do David Paper justice. Um, I only got notice of this um, last Thursday, so it's a little bit of a I feel this is a massively important subject, and it would not be unreasonable to claim that interchangeable manufacturing and precision engineering underpins the modern world. If you think about the chips in your modern, your, your mobile phone, it's precision that lets us make them. They're now in a position where they're no longer using x-rays to basically etch the chip. They are too large. They are now looking at using particle accelerators to get the precision. So we're now in a period of 250 years. We've moved from manufacturing items where the thickness of a worn sixpence was seen to be good to something where we're talking about atomic scale. Now, I know that doesn't apply to mechanical engineering, but think about the jet engines, your, your car engines. Without interchangeable manufacture and precision, none of that would exist. So David's paper tries to trace how we've ended up with the precision methodologies that we use today. We're very fortunate there's a massive amount of information available on the history of interchangeable manufacturing and precision engineering. This includes books, papers and standards on a wide <coughs> variety of associated technological development. It doesn't exist in a vacuum. Standardisation was absolutely critical in terms of measurement. Machine tools. Without more precise machine tools, precision couldn't have existed. Jigs. Fixtures and precision measurement. These were, these underpinned the Metrology. David's subject is metrology, the science of measurement. Hawley has one of the best collections of metrology. And not least of all, materials. Changing the materials have really revolutionized. These advances have been paralleled by developments in engineering drawing and design techniques. We'll go with that. We can get some feedback. The importance of geometric tolerancy is that you can, the designer can tell the manufacturer exactly what is wanted. Communication between designers and manufacturers is very, very critical in this. Therefore, given the breadth of the subject, I can only hope in this short presentation to briefly touch upon the more important aspects. Because the focus of this workshop is on Joseph Brammer and Henry Maudsley and their early contribution to precision engineering, and will give an example of their work, I will also cover some of the other individuals who were involved in these developments during the 18th and 19th century, particularly firearm manufacturers in France and America. John Anning, uh, who is in the audience and who some of you know, recently brought to my attention work undertaken by the companies of John Penn and Sons, and Maudley Southern Field between 1854 and 56 on the interchangeable manufacture of marine engines, and I will also briefly cover this. Sheffield made a significant contribution to interchangeable manufacture in the late 1930s, and Mr. Parker at the Admiralty Gauge Inspection Department in Sheffield produced the first booklet on geometric tolerancy for interchangeable manufacturing, and I will briefly mention this important subject. I will also bring the subject up to date by giving a description of the advanced precision manufacturing taking place at a local engineering company, AEC. Tom uh, Broadbent from that is going to talk in more detail this afternoon. It seems sensible at this stage to provide some definition as to what is meant by interchangeable manufacture and precision engineering and to explain the relationship between them. Um, <coughs> these are long slides, and I think the best thing is if I quickly read them to you. 
In his paper in 1937, Rowe stated that interchangeable manufacture means the production of complete machines or mechanisms, the corresponding parts of which are so nearly alike that they will fit into any of the given mechanisms. Probably it's a, a, a truism to say that now. Thus, from this definition, it can be deduced that interchangeable parts or components are for all practical purposes identical. They are manufactured to patterns or design tolerances that ensure that they will fit into any assembly of the same type. Thus, one such component can be readily replaced by another without any custom fitting, such as filing. The car industry has developed this to the ultimate level. If you think this is why you can jump into your car and drive it off at 70 miles an hour from day one, you know, without that it wouldn't work. Thus, to fully implement interchangeable manufacture, accurate machine tools and accurate measuring instruments and gauges are essential. Woodbury, in his paper in 1960, the legend of Eli Whitney, states that, to be successful, interchangeable parts require the following elements to be present. Precision machine tools, precision gauges or other precision instruments of measure, uniformly accepted measurement standards, and certain techniques of mechanical drawing. Woodbury also states, and here we see Whitney, that Whitney's firearm components could not have been truly interchangeable because elements three and four, that is, uniformly accepted measurement standards and certain techniques of mechanical drawing were largely absent and would not be in general use for two more generations. So this concept that America led on this has become one of those sort of early <coughs> myths of manufacturing. But uh, they did lead, but they weren't first in the field. Ken Older, in his book, Engineering the Revolution, and that Woodbury's, Woodbury's list highlights the essential role of standards in realizing interchangeable <coughs> parts production. He also states that there is a fifth element to have direct control over the, pro the pr process of production. At this talk, stage in my talk, I would like to explain what precision engineering is and to put it in a historical concept. I'm sorry that this is slightly heavier than this morning's papers. Um, it's, it's looking at the, the, the sort of technical stuff behind. Lowen and his colleagues in their paper of 1980, Metrology Problems in General Engineering, Engineering, a comparison with precision engineering, <coughs> states that the term precision engineering is used to define machines and tools that are designed to operate to accuracy levels one or two orders of magnitude greater than the standard types of machine tools. However, in order for this definition to be meaningful, it is necessary to have some idea of what is meant by accuracy levels and their manufacture. In 1979, R.B. Jones of World War II scientific military intelligence fame wrote in the first editorial in the journal Precision Engineering that precision engineering could be defined by the ratio of dimension to tolerance or measurement uncertainty. He stated that for precision engineering, this ratio was in the order of 10 to the 4th or 10 to the 5th. Over the four decades since Jones wrote that original edition, Precision engineers have tried to make this ratio larger and is now probably in the order of 10 to the 7th. So you, you know, we are getting very, very, very fine tolerances now. In the Hornet Tool Collection, we define precision as any dimensional accuracy equal to or greater than 1,000th of an inch. 25 microns. This dif differentiates precision from other methods of manufacture and measurement. So now having defined the terminology, let's return to Maudsley and by our example show how his work and that of his friend and near contemporary, Brian Donkey, can be seen as the original originators of precision engineering. At this point it's probably worth noting that today's precision engineer is tomorrow's general engineer. For example, in their day, Henry Maudsley's tools would be classified as precision tools. 
They would, however, have probably been accurate to no more than one hundredth, or at a maximum, one thousandth of an inch. A tolerance that is easily exceeded by all modern machine tools. This is, however, not to decry Morse's contribution. Morse's bench micrometer, built in 1805 and nicknamed the Lord Chancellor because it was the final arbitrator in all questions of accuracy, was the outstanding achievement. When tested by the National Physical Laboratory in 1919, it was found to be extraordinarily accurate. The key to this, as Richard has explained this morning, was Maudley's ability to generate read screws. So we go through this generation, the first one on the first lathe, that generates a second lathe, lead screw for a second lathe, which in turn generates the lead screw for the micrometer. This enabled him to generate a precision lead screw which had 100 threads per inch and with 100 divisions on the hand wheel it allowed measurements to 1,000th of an inch in modern terms, 25 microns a comparison with the human air is 0.1 millimeter so this is incredibly fine Considering that Morsley's Lord Chancellor dates from 85 this was an incredible achievement, and it wasn't to be met for many years more by others. <coughs> Another engineer of this period who made major contributions was Brian Donkin. This is, as we saw this morning, the micrometer. Brian Donkin was an old friend and colleague of Henry Worsley, and he was the one, and he was an outstanding engineer at his time. Not only did he produce a precision screw cutting lathe and a linear dividing engine, but working alongside the famous company of Taunton Sims, he made a major contribution to the manufacture of the standard yard. For those of you who would like to know more about Donkey, his work is well described in the brilliant book by Maureen Greenland and Russ Day, or both in the audience with us, uh, and it is well worth a read. The other group of early engineers who made major contributions to the development of interchangeable manufacture were the clockmakers. Although I'm not going to attempt to cover their significant contributions in this talk, it could be that clockmakers led in the development of techniques for working to type dimensional tolerances, and that precision engineers then took these techniques and applied them to larger systems with more stringent relative accuracy. For example, David and Joseph Brown, who founded the famous American precision engineering company of Brown and Shaw, were clockmakers in the early days of the company built tower clocks. So you see this basically transition there. Brown and Shaw actually were very interesting because it's an area I heard quite well. Their work of 1870 was one of the very, very first uh, fully fireproof buildings in America, and it eventually extended to over a million square feet which is not a small work if you think about it. Important as these developments were, the key question is, how did this new ability to produce precision goods translate into manufacturing during the Industrial Revolution? Prior to the Industrial Revolution, mechanical goods had been built by craftsmen who would fettle each part individually to fit into an assembly. By generating a massive increase in the demand for all goods, the Industrial Revolution transformed the production and processing of metals, such as cutting. The origins of modern quality control systems can also be traced to this period. Incremental improvements in the design of machine tools, including the, the use of iron and steel, resulted in greater machine tool rigidity. This is something that's not been talked about this morning. That if you don't have rigidity in your, your machine tools, you're going to get uh, tool chatter, and you're going to lose accuracy. So this is something, it's an area which I tend to feel is always underplayed by people. Um, I'll give you a quick digression. We, we talk about um, the mills, heavy construction of mill buildings. If the mill buildings were not constructed very, very rigidly, the vibrations in them would have just shut them to pieces. Um, you know, if you look at the Soho, the drawings of Soho Foundry, the machinery is actually built into the wall. So you've got to get it very firm. The same period produced a new cadre of precision tool designers and builders who were also born, which included engineers such as Joseph Brammer, Henry Morsley, Brian Donkin, Joseph Whitworth, Matthew Murray, Richard Roberts, James Naismith, 
for Joseph Clemens. It, it's surprising actually that many of those have connections to this area. James Nays oh, Naismith's got connections, Clemens has all, they've all got their connections up here. These engineers could be considered to be the pioneers of precision engineering. The perception that Britain was the leader in this field is ha was however shaken by the American exhibits in the Great Exhibition of 1851. These machines caught quite a stir and were subject to much comment in the technical press. Um, for those of you who may not have looked at this, this was the, the fact that basically they just didn't believe that the Americans could have produced machinery on this nature. Britain machinery at that time was seen as being very, very heavy, over-designed. The American machines were seen as being much lighter, uh, much easier to use, and much and containing many more innovations. The products of the American industry so impressed the British government that in 1854 it appointed a commission which included Joseph Whitworth to visit the United States and report on what became known as the American system of manufacture. Three reports were produced, one by the committee, one by Mr George Wallace and one by Whitworth. These gave a major stimulus to British manufacturers to develop interchangeable manufacture using specially designed machine tools. The reports also clearly showed that the emergence of the United States as a world economic power. It is said that the expansion of the Enfield Armory commencing in 1855 was undertaken with machinery purchased from the United States, although current research by Phil Abbott of the Royal Armouries in Leeds shows that British machine tools were also supplied to Enfield. The common myth has it that Eli Whitney in America pioneered internet interchangeable manufacturing in the late 18th and 19th century. Now, as I mentioned earlier, Woodbury states that this could not have been the case. In fact, current research shows that interchangeable parts for the muskets were first produced in France during the 18th century. This was a crucial development as it meant that an army could carry spare parts and quickly exchange them for broken ones. These parts still needed some fettling to fit into the assembly, but instead of fitting each part to the individual gun, they were fitted to the master part. So here we have the forces leaving. You, know, you could actually uh, take that one step forward and uh, compare it to 3D printing in the battlefield these days. It's the same incremental improvements. Probably the most notable in France, innovators in France, were General Jean Baptiste. I'm going to get this wrong. <laughs> uh, Grubierville and Henri Blanc. A recent paper by Peter Smithhurst, Russia. France, Russia, and early interchangeability in firearms covers the early history of interchangeable firearms and explains in some detail the involvement of Henri Blanc. The paper also shows that interchangeable musket parts were made in Russia at about the same time, which is a little known fact. A few years later, American gun makers started using this method but adopted it to their unskilled workers. They filed gauges to fit the master part, and workers would set jigs to production machines. They also made wide, widespread use of gauges and check parts. So here we've got an example of the set of gauges held by the Royal Armouries that were produced for the manufacture of the Enfield Patent Rifle of 1853. The first US arms to be with interchangeable parts were pistols produced by Simeon North in Springfield, Massachusetts and at John Hall's Rifle Works at Harpers Ferry, West Virginia. Simeon North's role in, is described in the book Simeon North, First Official P Pistol Maker of the United States, written by his two grandson. Now, Simeon North is, is very, very little known in this country, better known in America. The important aspect of all this is that it enabled a series of machines, each carrying out a single operation with, a sing with an unskilled operator to produce accurately gauged parts, which could be assembled into complex machines without the need for fitting. And this, is, this is the revolution before guns, etc. required highly skilled workers. Here we've got the skill being put into the machines, not into the people. To recap on gauging and interchangeable manufacture, I can do no better than quote from Rolt's 
excellent two volumes on gauges and fine measurements published in uh, 1929. Rolt states that work made in any number of factories to identical gauges will be satisfactorily interchangeable, providing that the gauging systems used are similar and are referred to one standard of measurement. To arrive at such uniformity of production between different sources of supply, it is the practice to make use of some central authority for the verification of the several sets of standard gauges which form the basis of measurement. In the UK, MPL fulfills this purpose by holding the national measurement standards to which all gauges must comply. This is why actually I didn't know about this one, but so so. Thus it can be seen that the foundation for modern interchangeable manufacturing had been laid over a hundred years before Henry Ford and Charles Sorison would apply these ideas to the manufacture of the Model T Ford, and William Durant, Alfred Sloan, and William Leland would, produce, would introduce them into General Motors. Returning now to Joseph Brammer and Henry Maudsley and the contribution that they made to precision engineering by focusing on one example. As we heard this morning, in 1784, Bramall was awarded patent number 1430 for his design of an ultra-secure lock. And here's an example, here's the front page of the patent. Now, whilst I can follow this drawing, I always feel that the following one is much clearer in how it explains the lock's motion. If you look at the drawing, you have the key here, as we saw this morning, which is a whole hollow barrel. And that slots into there, depressing the sliders against a common plate using a single spring. This allows the key, as we saw this morning, to turn the barrel, enabling the bolt to be shot by means of a crank pin. For successful of the operation, the component parts of the lock had to be precisely made. And as you heard this morning, Brammer employed the young Henry Morsley to manufacture the required machine tools which Brammer had designed. Precisions were made, machines were made that accurately cut the slides in the keys and the corresponding slots in the barrel. The accurate positioning of the, the cutting tool was controlled by a micrometer screw so that the notches in the key lined up exactly with the slots in the barrel. Modern Brammer locks have a tolerance of two, two and a half thou of an inch on these dimensions. <coughs> These machines are an early example of the application of mass production methods to precision engineering. Another engineer who made major contributions was, George, was John Payne. Whilst Maudley and Brammer's lock was on, a small, was, was on small items, Payne worked on a much, much larger scale. The son of a millwright who was born in Grange in 1805 and would go on to become one of the preeminent marine engineers in the middle of the 19th century. He's probably best remembered for, for work on marine engines and propeller systems during the transition from sail to steam. In the period 1854-1856, the Royal Navy built a total of 156 gunboats of five different classes for Britain's Baltic fleet. Now, this was a massive contract which had to be completed in a very short time. John Pennant's sons and Maudsley's son and field were chosen as the main contractors for the supply of the engines. Pennant was responsible for 97 engines and Maudsley for 59 engines. Because of the massive workload and the short time scales involved, subcontracting arrangements were made with other firms. However, to ensure compatibility, Penn dismantled two of his recently completed engines and distributed the parts to the best manufacturers and ordered 90 of each components to be made identical to the parts supplied as templates. So, Penn and Maudsley were thus providing patterns and engineering drawings, and no doubt had someone checking them. Now you can see here the clear parallels with the Americans were doing in small arms manufacture, but on very, very much larger items. So you can see how it developed. At the time, there were no national standards of measurement and most workshops used their own length and screw thread gauges. 
To ensure interchangeability, the Admiralty required all subcontractors to work in accordance with the work worth measurement system. So you see the second component coming in here, which is the need for standardisation. A more de detailed description of Penn's contribution is given in Whitworth's obituary in the Times of 1854. And really this says not a great deal more than we're saying here, but as you can see, he's, just, he's, he's basically taking an engine apart and turning the finished components into templates, and they're basically having the parts manufactured to those templates. <coughs> I would now like to, to briefly mention Sheffield's contribution to the development of interchangeable manufacture. A key aspect of the design process is being able to convey clearly and precisely to the manufacturer exactly what is required. Sheffield's contribution was to develop a standard system of how drawings of components were represented in, thus linking design to manufacture. Mr. Stanley Parker was a gauge designer at the Naval Ordnance Department gauge facility in Jason Street in Sheffield and a pioneer of geometric tolerancy. In the 1930s, he experienced difficulties when designing gauges for controlling the interchangeability of ordnance components because the dimensions and tolerances shown in the drawings did not sufficiently control the geometric shape. Now, I, I had difficulty with that sentence as well. <laughs> but basically, it, it is incredibly important this promoted Mr. Parker to set out in a booklet form in 1938 a series of ideas which precisely described a method for showing dimensions and tolerances so that the manufacturers knew exactly what he wanted. And this booklet here can be seen very, very much as one of the underpinning documents for mass production techniques. It also underpinned the development of the important aspects of British standards. This document was eventually taken on board by the Ministry of Supply and became the defining document for the dimensional analysis of engineering drawings. Subsequently, that in turn led to the publication of British Standard BS 308, produced in 1953, and that was superseded in 2000, and the current standard 8888 came out and it had been subsequently updated in 2016-2017 amendments. To summarise, since Morsley's time there has been a tremendous advance in the design and construction of precision machine tools. Morsley's Lord Chancellor could measure to an accuracy of one thousandth of an inch. Human hair is about 0.1 millimetre, so it's a quarter of it. A modern definition of high precision machining is the production of components with tolerances and tool positions below 10 micrometers or even 5 micrometers. Below these tolerances, the phrase ultra precision machining is used. To bring things up to, up to date, precision manufacturing is continuing to develop, and Sheffield is making a major contribution to these developments through the work of organisations such as AMRC and firms such as AEC and Robin. The following slides show some of the modern generation of multi-axis machine tools that are in use at AEC, and our final speaker, Tom Broadman, is going to talk about in more detail. Now, I'm sure there are people in this audience who can tell me a lot more about these machines than I can tell you. <laughs> but, um, this is a five-axis machine. I'm told that this is an 11 axis machine. <laughs> Actually, if you go to any seal, as some of us were fortunate enough to do just over a year ago, it is incredible. Um, the factory is has ultra purely pure air in there. You're talking about an air that's filtered to the same standard as an operating theatre. And the MD maintained that he wanted the floor clean enough so that staff could eat their sandwiches off it. But it, it, was, it was an absolutely, it was an eye-opener uh, to anybody that hasn't been into a machine shop in the last 20 years. It was so totally revolutionary, uh, I, I just didn't believe it. Today, multi-access computer numeric control machines 
some of which can have 11 axes, can machine complex components with a single setup. These machines are all classified as precision machine tools if we compare those constructed 10 years ago. My final slide shows the, the workflow used at AEC, where the, public, where the precision engineering process has been taken one stage further and now is now completely digital using Siemens Teamware software. The digital data is transferred to Siemens NX computer-aided manufacturing software, which converts the design information into CAM. The CAM data is then sent to the post-process into the language needed to drive the multi-axis machines, and very cut is used to simulate the tool path to ensure that it works. Finally, the machine operates through a graphical interface which the user downloads to run the machine. In conclusion, Brammer, through his need for precision in the manufacturing of, of his lock, employed the brilliant young engineer Henry Maudsley, and together they developed what can be considered to be the first high precision manufacturing process. This work started a revolution that is continuing to this day. It is wonderful to know that all of this started with Brammer and Maudsley nearly 200 years ago. And that's basically what David said to me. I've done my best with it. <laughs> there are areas in there which basically, if David had been here, I'm sure he could have expanded upon. Uh, but um, if the people have got questions, I will do my best to answer them because I have discussed some of it with David uh, and I will try my best to explain it. that just before I left, um, <clears throat> before I retired, that was about 12 years ago, I had the opportunity to go round Renault's Grand Prix um, facility, which is near Oxford. And it was really interesting to see that same sort of precision engineering. And I remember we had a, a they gave us a little piece of metal that was a reject, actually, um, that was part of the front uh, driving strut. And he said, you know, just have a look at that. And as you, as you moved it in one way, it came apart into about three pieces. And you put it back together and you couldn't <coughs> see the gap. It was so, I think it was laser cut, but it was so brilliantly engineered. And it just reminded me that that wasn't a, such a mass production one, but it was to get the parts ready for interchanging, you know, in a Grand Prix race ready. And absolutely precision engineered. My, my first experience of, of precision engineering came. I thought it would be about 17 or 18. It came over a Christmas period. We had, a, um, near to where I lived, um, a subcontractor to Rolls Royce, and they were manufacturing the bearings for the Rolls Royce engines. And they got an incredible rejection rate. And they couldn't understand this for a long time until they realized that the pipework taking the water to the machine tools was iron. It had got a bacterial infection in it, and basically the bacterial infection was getting into the coolant mix that was being used on them. And it was then when the, the components were coming off the production line, finished to the necessary accuracy. And in the period they were being stored, before they went on to the next process, which was a wash and clean, bacterial activity on the surface of the bearings was sufficient to get the rejection rate up. So th this astounded me. I, I remember we basically, um, uh, uh, my family had a plumbing heating business and basically we went in and blitzed it one Christmas. Never earned so much money ever before. <laughs> I think we were only two, we were two or three hundred pounds in, in four or five days. Uh, but it was, it was unbelievable that it got to a point where bacterial activity could be reducing, producing reject rates. And this is where my, where my interest in what was effective precision came from where I started to read it. Yeah, approximately uh, two years ago, South Yorkshire, a group of the Newcomen Society, went down to the Advanced Manufacturing Research Centre at Catcliffe, only a few miles down the road. I remember in the Boeing uh, machining area, uh, research and development work had been done on behalf of Boeing, Seattle, 
to look at a particular structural component that was possible of the earth for Bowen to machine over in Seattle. And the boys at ANRC, you know, the post grads and the you know, sort of doctoral uh, uh, students down there, using a multi axis CNC machine with all the bells and whistles, they cut down the cycle time for the production of this very complex component by a factor of about 10. And I can't remember the actual figures in minutes that it took to machine it, but something tells me it was 90 minutes in Seattle and something like five minutes in the AMRC. I'm not sure, I'm not sure on the figures, but it was exactly that. That John Penn was a pioneer in interchangeable manufacture isn't in doubt. But what is extremely interesting is that only one of the gunboat, 60 horsepower gunboat engines exists or has been found. And that was discovered by amateur divers uh, in Port Gregory in Western Australia something like 30 years ago. And this Engine is now has been restored and is running in the uh, Fremantle Shipwreck Museum and is well worth a visit. And it is the only pen engine, known pen engine in the world. Now, the first thing you're going to say, HMS Warrior has got a pen engine. Uh, it's a reproduction. And if you're ever in Western Australia, do go and see it because I've had the pleasure of watching it in restoration for the last, almost annually for the last 20 years and it's well worth a visit. David's waving his hand madly. Yeah, there are two other pen engines, one's in Southampton Maritime Museum. If you want to go on one that's still in steam, go up to Dresden and the lake steamer there has an 1830 <coughs> still powering it. There's also a pen, a pen oscillating engine. He was famous for oscillating engines. And there's one in the uh, uh, Museum of Internal Fire in, uh, in remote Cardiganshire. <laughs> <laughs> I can't describe where it is. Yeah. I want to go from sublime to ridiculous here because uh, the, the archaeologists uh, unearthed the ceramic, the ceramic warriors in China. And they found there, I believe, that the, the crossbow um, mechanism <coughs> was cast brass and was interchangeable. It's, it's relatively easy to produce virtually identical components in cast brass by the lost wax method. Um, so, but it's much, much more difficult to produce identical components in, in iron, um, particularly where the surface finish is important. Yeah, just uh, on uh, Saturday night we were dining with a friend over in Chester who worked for the Ministry, the Atomic Energy Authority in Cape Verdeus, and they built ultra precision machines 40 years ago, uh, centrifuges, and he was telling me that there's one of them still running and it's run now continuously with no maintenance whatsoever for 30 years because it's precision is to a molecular level. This this is on air yeah. And it runs on air yeah. Please. Um, this is a bit of an aside, but I, I, it might open up an avenue of exploration. I believe that uh, you've got two factors in any machine frame. You've got rigidity and you've got damping capacity. And I think it's well known that cast irons, and there are many of them, but some of them are particularly good for their damping capacity. And I'm just wondering whether the reputations of some of these companies might not have been based not totally, but in perhaps some measure, on their either empirical or experience gained knowledge of precise design of frames and beds. And it seems to me that we have got to focus on, on the screw threads and position parts, but perhaps the big old mundane lump underneath has got some technology. <coughs> and just last point, when you look at the early cannonballs, I sometimes wonder, given their low speeds and the huge masses for the time that they were rotating, whether 
good old solid piles of oak didn't have very useful damping capacity. Yes. Picking up on the damping, you see a very, very interesting parallel in building construction, particularly fireproof building construction um, in the UK and America. In the UK, we went for relatively light cast iron, wrought iron framing for buildings. In America, they went for very, very heavy timber. You achieve exactly the same fire rating in both. The difference is that in America, the buildings can be both larger and are more damped than a comparable size building in England would be because of this, the mass effect. And so this whole business about rigidity of machine tools is something that is not really referred to in any writing. And I think it's a big, big thing that is being missed. I also feel that certain of the manufacturers were extremely fortunate in the cast irons they were using because certain of the cast iron from around here basically take the pattern extremely well and some don't. And so basically it's a very, very much more complicated picture than just improvements in machinery. It's, it's all the components we've got. I suspect that it was only empirical at that time, but it, it is there. Okay, I'll type one more question point. Tea a little bit early, so just for May's Peter. Uh, thank John or <coughs> David. Uh, John and David. And just to say one more uh, point about sort of imperial global history the, the, the fleet deployed in the Baltic during the Anglo French War against Russia in the mid 1850s was the first entirely steam driven fleet deployed by the Royal Navy. Okay, thank you. <coughs> thank you.